Okay, in this video, uh, I am going to um, illustrate how you can uh, test for mediational processes in the context of a latent growth curve model. Um, basically, uh, this was inspired by an article that I was reading this morning. It was by uh, Curran and Husang, written back in 2003, uh, called The Use of Latent Trajectory Models in Psychopathology Research. And um, although the example is not the same as it's, that's pr uh, presented in uh, this article, uh, I thought this would be kind of a nice uh, thing to illustrate to you um, in the context of uh, AMOS um, modeling. So uh, I have my AMOS program open, and basically I have a, a growth curve model that I uh, demonstrated in one of my earlier videos um, where we were looking at change over time in terms of perceived math ability in a, in a group of students. Um, and uh, we, we had our intercept, param uh, intercept um, factor and our slope factor, and these are just uh, representing uh, growth parameters for each uh, student. So each student's growth trajectory uh, in terms of their perceived math ability is uh, partially a function of their starting uh, levels of perceived math ability which is represented by the uh, intercept or their in individual intercepts and then uh, the uh, change over time represented by the slope uh, factor and um, so basically when we ran the model um, you know we saw that um, when we click on this little button here model fit we saw that we had a uh, good model fit to the data. Uh, here's our CFI right here uh, and our TLI. Both of those are you know, well above 0.05, uh, excuse me, 0.95, excuse me. Uh, the RMSCA is 0.048, which is uh, indicating good uh, model fit to the data. So overall, um, our uh, single domain model was exhibiting good fit to the data. When we looked under the estimates, um, we saw uh, in terms of the um, you know, we looked under the, uh, the means and we saw uh, the uh, intercept um, um, estimate right here is basically kind of an average um, level of, um, of perceived math ability at time one. And then the slope um, mean is essentially representing um, an average slope, basically a, a slope that's kind of averaged across uh, the students. So um, we saw in general that uh, the slope on perceived math ability appear basically perceived math ability appeared to decrease over time um, uh, among the students. So because there's our negative coefficient, we also saw that the covariance between the uh, intercept and the slope uh, was uh, negative and statistically significant. So in other words, basically uh, students who who started off at a higher level of perceived math ability, their rate of change. Uh, was uh, less than that of students who started off at uh, lower levels of perceived math ability. So um, at any rate, now let's take a, a quick look at um, an, another option. So uh, in, in my previous videos, I also incorporated sex as a predictor of these variables. So just kind of building from our from building up, I'm going, going to start off by incorporating sex as a predictor of these two variables. Uh, so this is a little bit of a refresher, but we're going to use sex as a predictor of um, our intercepts, our ran, uh, randomly varying intercepts and slopes. Um, now, because our factors are now going to be uh, outcome variables, we want to make sure that we incorporate disturbance terms associated with these. So uh, at this point, what I'll do is, um, let me move this over just a shade here. At this point, what I'll do is I will right-click, click on Object Properties. I'll call this D1, and this disturbance I'll call D2. And now I can draw my uh, arrows to each of these um, uh, factors right here. Uh, I think we also allowed um, the um, disturbances to correlate and, in this kind of way. So now we have sex uh, predicting the uh, random variation in intercepts and slopes um, among our students. So when we clicked on calculate estimates, um, you know, basically what we saw uh, in terms of model fit, we see you know the CFI is you know as essentially one, TLI is very high, RMSEA is really low. So we're doing a pretty good job of um, of fitting our um, our uh, model to the data. When we look at the estimates, you know, we see basically uh, in terms of the um, relationship between sex 
and the intercept again intercept is essentially representing um, uh, time uh, uh, time one perceptions of math ability and, you know the coding was for sex uh, the coding was uh, zero for female one for male so basically that coefficient right here is representing the difference uh, between males and females um, at time one. It looks like that males tended to perceive greater perceived math ability than uh, females. Um, and then when we look at sex in relation to the slope, um, you know, we have a negative coefficient here, uh, basically indicating that um, the rate of change uh, over time in perceived math ability was less for males than it was uh, for females. So females tended to exhibit more change over time uh, than males. Um, when we looked at the um, uh, the average, um, you know, the average uh, intercepts, this would be the time one uh, intercepts uh, controlling for sex, uh, or the time one perceived math ability controlling for sex, and then we have the slope parameter still representing um, uh, the fact that um, that overall males uh, overall. Um, our students exhibited decreases in um, perceptions of math ability over time. So, but it does look like that the rate of change is less for uh, males than for females. Um, and um, so there you go. When we look at the, um, the variances now, you can see we have uh, the variance in terms of our disturbance terms. And this is actually reflecting variance that's not accounted for in our intercept and uh, slope uh, factors um, due to sex and so we've got these are the variance estimates and both of these are statistically significant and we see this is the covariance between uh, the um, um, intercept and slope factors is statistically significant so even you know even after accounting for sex you know we, we still see that there's variation in the uh, intercept and slope factors that's not accounted for by you know like I said by the um, sex of, of the students so now let's move on and we'll move to, towards uh, adding in um, our testing and mediation model. So I'm going to actually, I'm going to take this out and I'm going to uh, delete these two paths right here. And what I want to do is I want to test whether uh, the effect of sex onto these, on these uh, growth parameters, um, whether it's mediated uh, by uh, uh, math achievement at time one. So um, I don't have a theoretical model for why that would be the case or theoretical rationale, but this is just to demonstrate uh, this particular approach. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to copy this figure here. keeps it all um, keeps it uh, nicely uh, organized. And then I will click right here and then I'm going to move up to um, let's see if I can find it here. It was um, math grades at time one. So there it is. So I'm going to move this down here and uh, let me just kind of clean this up a, a little a little touch here. So I'm actually going to um, just uh, resize this a shade so it fits in there. Now what I have to do is uh, anytime that I have a variable that is an outcome of another variable it has to have an error term. So we had error terms up, up above which was reflecting perceived math ability at times one, two, and three, and this is the, the variation in perceived math ability not accounted for by the interceptor slope parameters. Now, you know, in our previous model, we had sex as a predictor of the uh, intercept and slope uh, factors, and so, um, and so that's why we had to have disturbance terms. So now I'm going to add in a disturbance term for this variable as well, since this variable is going to be an outcome of uh, students' uh, sex. So now I'm going to uh, right click object properties and I'm going to call this variable um, D3 and I will incorporate a, a, a line that, that runs to math grades from sex and then from math grades I'm going to um, r run to in the intercept and slopes okay or the intercept and slope factor so now I'm testing um, a, a mediation model and um, if I wanted to incorporate a direct effect, I could do that as well. Like, let's say that I think that part of the variation in intercept is accounted for by, um, by math grades and by sex. And essentially what we have right here, we have uh, the mediated effect through, uh, from sex to, inter through the, uh, to the uh, 
intercept factor via math grades, and then we also have a direct effect. So this is kind of reflecting a partial mediation model, whereas the effect of sex on slope factor is fully mediation or fully mediated. So now I'll click on calculate estimates, and uh, you, you know you'll see right here in terms of the model fit. Uh, CFI is still pretty good, TLI is good, RMSEA actually bumps up a bit to 0 0.078 um, so we we have a little bit less fit in this particular model. I'll, I'll quickly show you though in the previous model I think we also in had incorporated correlation uh, between these two disturbance terms right here um, so if we add that back into the model and look you know you'll see that um, our fit is um, still quite good and so we have our CFI and TLI are above 0.95 our MSCA is 0.047 when we look at the estimates you'll see that we you know we have um, in this particular case we've got sex as a predictor of math grades remember the coding uh, females were coded 0 males were coded 1 and you can see right here that um, that uh, that essentially males uh, scored lower on average in terms of math grades um, um, at, at time one than females and so and that difference was statistically significant so it's a little funny uh, actually because what you know what uh, it looks like that um, you know when you look here in terms of sex and and that direct effect of sex on the intercepts uh, you see that we have a positive association uh, meaning that males um, you know, on average, at, at time one, they tended to perceive uh, greater per, uh, math ability. So they're actually perceiving greater math ability at time one, while at the same time performing uh, worse um, in terms of the time one grade. So it's kind of interesting. So we have, uh, you know, both of these uh, tests indicate statistically significant relationships. We see math grades as um, as a uh, predictor of um, um, perceived math ability and so we see a positive relationship here and it's statistically significant so basically uh, students who had scored um, higher on the the math grades uh, I guess time one if you will uh, also tended to, to perceive greater uh, math ability at time one so that kind of stands to reason as well uh, keep in mind I, I'm using math grades uh, measurement measured at time one as a general predict variable for math grades the data set actually incorporates a math grades time two and, and time three but we're treating uh, math grades time one as essentially a time invariant uh, variable that's associated with the with the students um, we we could have you know built in the other two and had uh, time variant covariate but we didn't do that in this particular model with respect to math grades and the slope uh, parameter though we see our slope factor we see uh, no significant relationship between the two so that actually um, so it looks like that the math grades variable was unrelated to um, students uh, growth trajectories uh, with respect to perceived uh, math ability so at any rate uh, when we look down a little bit further you can see we have um, uh, you know the uh, average um, in terms of the uh, intercepts for um, or the time one average for perceived math ability um, after controlling for um, the uh, math grades one and uh, sex um, you can see right here this is the um, the student average if you will in terms of their intercepts and then this is the slope and you can see this uh, it's uh, negative so in other words, uh, it turns out that um, our re-specification actually, you know, we see that there's um, a, a slight negative uh, trajectory in terms of perceived math ability, uh, but that, um, that is uh, still not statistically significant. When we look at, um, you know, our variances re related to the, um, uh, you know, uh, D1 and D2 variables, uh, you can see right here, that we still have significant variation in terms of the intercepts and, and slopes because the D1 was associated with the, uh, the variation in intercepts, D2 was associated with the variation in slopes. So um, in terms of the fixed effect for the slope it was not significant but evidently there's still some variation uh, in the slopes uh, that could theoretically be accounted for by adding in additional predictors. Under estimates uh, and scalars you can see we've got um, 
although we didn't ask for it for indirect effects in our model. So let's let's take a quick look and and try this a different way. So now under output, I'm going to ask for indirect, direct, and total effects. So let's say I want to test the indirect effect of uh, sex on perceived um, the the uh, intercept factor and the slope factor. So I would click on indirect, direct, and total effects, uh, and I can bootstrap these results. I've already set it for bootstrap. A uh, thousand bootstrap samples with a 90% confidence interval. I could obviously raise that if I wanted to, but I'm just going to stick with the default for this particular example here. So when I run the analysis, um, you know things are not going to change in terms of the the overall fit. Everything's going to be the same. Now when I click under uh, estimates and under matrices, you'll see I've got indirect effects right here. So we have the indirect effect of sex. On, um, on the slope and the intercept um, factors right here. So this is the indirect effect of sex on both of these. So um, now if I want to test these for statistical significance, I can go down to the bootstrap confidence uh, results and I'd actually ask for uh, the confidence interval, that 90% confidence interval. And so what I'm looking for, uh, there are two ways I can do this. I can either look at the lower bound and upper bound for the confidence intervals and then determine if zero, which is the null, falls within, in which case I would maintain the null and conclude there's no indirect effect. Or I could, uh, um, or if zero falls outside the confidence interval, then I can infer that there's a significant indirect effect. Uh, or I could go down here to these um, p values for the two tail tests and, and, and look at that. So you'll see in terms of sex and its relationship to the uh, slope, uh, that's the lower bound and the upper bound. So you can see that zero falls between the, the lower bound of negative 0.009 and the upper bound of 0 0.027. So that would argue uh, against rejecting the null hypothesis and inferring that there's no significant indirect effect. Uh, and you know, if you look at the p-value down here for that particular test of the, the indirect effect, it's also, you know, it's going to be consistent. Um, when you look at sex in its relationship to the uh, intercept factor, you can see there's a lower bound here, and um, and the uh, the upper bound for the interval. And you can see zero falls outside of this particular interval uh, that you see right here. So that would tell us then that there's a significant indirect effect of student sex on their um, um, the uh, intercepts for their uh, growth trajectories. Uh, we can also see there's our p-value here that also is going to indicate basically the same thing. So at any rate, um, that is just kind of a quick and dirty uh, overview of um, some options that are available to you in uh, Amos. Um, I wasn't able to really spend a lot of time unpacking everything or else this video could get quite large. But this is just to kind of demonstrate um, you know, some of the uh, the um, things that you can uh, model um, and like I said this was just basically testing um, um, uh, the mediational model that was the ultimate model and so you can see that basically uh, when it came to um, our mediation effects you know we, we saw that there was a significant indirect effect of sex on perceived um, um, uh, ability uh, essentially at time one and you know, we also had a, a significant direct effect um, and then we saw that uh, the indirect effect of sex on um, the slope factor, that was non-significant. So there was no evidence of mediation uh, of sex on uh, the, the uh, slope factor via uh, math grades. So that concludes this uh, video demonstration.